Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. This is episode two um, of Booze and Art, and um, I am live. So tune in whenever you want to. Um, so this episode I'm going to talk about um, one of my favorite whiskeys and one of my favorite distilleries and one of my favorite paintings. Um, so and my newest painting, in fact. Um, so I will begin. Uh, so the whiskey we will be talking about today is called Ichiro's Malt, um, double distilleries. Uh, so this is a really, it's got a really cool box. Um, oops, I have to get it out of first. <laughs> okay, so here is this beautiful bottle of whiskey. So this is a super cool, it has a super cool story as a distillery, and it also has um, a super cool story to me personally as a bottle. So um, let me just quickly talk about um, why this is a special bottle to me. Um, so I used to work at an amazing uh, little Japanese restaurant called Moshi Moshi in the Dog Patch. And um, I love them. They are still practically family to me. And uh, they go back um, several times a year to Japan uh, to get whiskey and do like awesome things and visit distilleries. And on one of these trips, um, my old manager brought uh, a bottle of Spirit Works rye whiskey that I had given him to a woman who owns a bar in Tokyo. She collects whiskey from all over the world and has a ex super extensive collection and has a particular love for American whiskey and rye. Uh, so I thought it would be such a cool thing for her to have a bottle of Spirit Works rye um, for her collection. So she sent me back this bottle, which is practically, you can't get it here. Um, or it's pr sold out in most places. It's really difficult to get. Um, and it is actually from my favorite distillery, um, Chichibu. So I named my cat Chichibu, who of course isn't here at the moment, but uh, that's how much I love it. But it also sounds like a little Pokemon, like Chichibu. So without further ado, I will continue to um, pour some of this. Oh God, this smells so good. Mm, okay. Um, so... Now there's a bottle of Spirit Works Rye sitting in a bar in Japan, and she sent this back to me, and I obviously, like, we've connected over Facebook and stuff, so this is such a cool, uh, one-of-a-kind, unique bottle, and I barely drink any of it because it's so special, but I will have some right now. Okay. Oh, man. So, um, this is a super interesting uh, whiskey anyway because... Uh, okay, so I mentioned Chichibu Distillery a few times. So Chichibu is actually a little town, um, and the distillery is owned by somebody named, um, let me get his last name correct, uh, Ichiro Akuto. And uh, his family has been in the um, uh, brewing business, actually, since about um, the late 1600s. They used to make sake. And they've been in that area, and they also had the sake distillery was actually in Hanyu, um, and uh, Ichiro-san's great or grandfather began a uh, whiskey distillery in in Hanyu in 1946, and um, sadly they had to the, they closed in 2000 because the Japanese whiskey market was sucking, and um, but there's all these barrels that were sitting there. And so when Ichiro-san opened up the Chichibu distillery um, and began all of his uh, new projects, um, they, he inherited a lot of his grandfather's old stock. So this particular bottle, that's why it's called Double Distilleries, because it has um, whiskey from the old stock, Hanyu Distillery, which was aged in um, sherry casks, and a lot of uh, new whiskey from the Chichibu Distillery, which they use a Japanese oak called Mizunara, and uh, that gives a really a different, totally different uh, kind of flavor profile than either Scotch or American whiskey. Um, and so that sherry cask, definitely get a lot of that sherry cask on the nose. Um, it has like a, like kind of a burns, like nutty, caramelized, nutty sort of um, chocolatey smell to it. Oh, 
Oh man, I forgot how good this is. Um, sorry. So when you taste it, it has a lot of like, uh, it's graham crackers, I would say a lot of like apricot. Um, uh, but then there's this like cut grass sort of flavor that I, um, I associate with that Mizunara oak that we don't get in the same sort of way from American white oak, which is what uh, American whiskey is aged in. So, um, I like this uh, neat. Oh, I should also, there's a couple fun uh, factoids. So, um, one of the coolest things I think ever, and this is kind of like some, I don't know, maybe one day I will ever get a chance to like try this, is, um, so in the Hanyu Distillery, they released an entire uh, like 54 different releases, uh, and there's only a few bottles of each release of um, whiskey that uh, has a, a different playing card as its label. So there's 54 cards in a deck, so there's 54 of these bottles of whiskey. And I mean, there's more than 54, but there aren't that many more than 54. So there's like the Queen of Hearts. There is, you know, the Ace of Spades. There's all of these, and each bottle is a different blend um, of the that old uh, sh um, uh, old stock of whiskey. And um, and there's all sorts of really like you can't even you can't find them. They're so difficult to find. Like recently at auction, I had something like it sold for five hundred thousand dollars, like a collection of one of each. Um, which is amazing that that even like someone can find it. So they've re-released it uh, since then, I think in 2004, um, but it's still unbelievably difficult to find. So it's a, such, it's a really cool idea to do not only a special label project, but also like each, each bottle is distinctly different in taste. And then I've also seen things online where like if you mix, um, like if you like make a full house, you know, like I forget what cards is in a full house, but if you make like a full house and then you put all of those whiskeys from a full house together and taste it, then um, uh, that's a whole really unique flavor. So you can blend them together like you can blend a deck of cards. Anyway, super nerdy, but like really awesome. Okay, so um, as I continue, mm, gosh, and there's like this amazing walnut like finish on the whiskey that's just still sitting on my palate as I'm speaking. So again, um, as I move away from, this is my Ichiro's malt, uh, double distilleries, uh, from the Chichibu and Hanyu distillery in Japan. Um, absolutely fantastic. If you ever have a chance to try, um, any of their releases, I highly recommend it. Okay. Um, now on to the, oh, I should recap quickly from last week. Last week we discussed the Mama Cthulhu giving birth to the cosmic World Egg sitting atop the uh, USS Enterprise um, as she does so. And she is, of course, kind of a representation of Kali as she holds a lightsaber and a severed Mr. Potato Head. Um, I have, this is a beautiful print. I have prints available. Um, if you want one, let me know. Uh, and it's a beautiful gicle print on canvas, stretched. Okay, business over. All right. So, Legend of the Golden Ewok. Um, here, I, I will zoom in for a closer view. All right, hold on a second. Okay, this is Legend of the Golden Ewok. Um, here are some of the details. There's the Golden Ewok in all of her glory. The white buffalo ATATs. And of course, the moon. Um, awesome. Some nice details. Uh, so, I just wanted to talk about um, like what this painting is about because there's a lot going on there, obviously. Uh, but basically, um, I feel that the Ewoks are an underrepresented group, um, and I, from speaking to some major, major Star Wars fans, I um, have learned that there's actually all sorts of, um, there's an entire Star Wars world that has been flushed out, like, with 
uh, fan books and extra like comics and all sorts of other things that have enriched that universe, um, not in the mainstream, but but kind of in. Uh, you know, kind of that media as well. So people that really like know, know. So apparently the Ewoks are a little more flushed out, but not in a mainstream way. So um, I just always think that there's this like bizarre thing in old Hollywood and, and not even old Hollywood because it happens a lot where like there's like a native population represented and it's like, oh, the happy natives, you know? And it's like, they serve just as like, a, like almost like as an active background and there's no interiority to any of those characters whatsoever. And, um, you know, okay, you can argue that, like, when they thought C-3PO was their god, like, you can kind of get, like, an idea of what's going on. Sure, fine. All right. Maybe. A little bit. But I still think that there, there can be room to suss that relationship out a little bit more and, and nuance it in a way that, um, uh, you know, can, can really uh, enrich that story. Um, so, of course, the, you know, they're the native population. Um, obviously, I think, obviously, they're shamanic, um, you know, they're tribal. Um, and I think, you know, if I'm going to categorize myself uh, with those cues, um, I'm going to assume that they um, are a goddess-worshipping tribe. Um, and uh, as a shamanic goddess-worshipping tribe, I um, included these... Um, little mushrooms around where the goddess is dancing. Uh, you know, I think that's relatively self-explanatory. Um, and uh, the goddess herself um, is broken up with like rays of like rainbow light. So the, I think that in this image illustrates that she's larger than life. She's not actually like, you know, a multi-breasted Ewok, but she, she is a, uh, a, a figure of imagination. So um, and golden, of course, because C-3PO is gold, so I figured there must be something gold that they worship, right? So, um, as she is, uh, oh, and then, no, there's not three boobs, there's four. Um, so yeah, there's one, two, three, there's four, it's just the angle, like, is behind her arm, you know, like, I can't give you everything in a painting, you have to just kind of figure it out. Um, so she is dancing, and as she is dancing, uh, you know, there's, um, there's shamanic magic happening. So these ATATs are, um, white buffalo unicorn pixies. And, uh, so I'm kind of taking that from like the Native American, like white buffalo woman. Um, it is very tongue in cheek, obviously, if I'm referring to like a shamanic native tribe, like using a white buffalo, like, you know, I, I know that it's very obvious, but that's part of, part of it, right? Like, because because there was just so nothing about them in the movies. Um, I just wanted to kind of stick that in there as a, as a trope, as it were. So the, the little um, at AT white buffalo unicorn fairies are, um, you know, they're cute. And they're her, they're her minions, they're her uh, uh, spirit animals, um, as it were. And then as she is dancing, the moon has become um, an Ouroboros, which is a snake that's eating its tail. It's an alchemical representation um, and a much more ancient representation, kind of a cross-cultural representation of um, eternity. Uh, so that um, there's a continuity uh, that anything that dies and is you know, that dies as the tail at the end is reborn again in the head. And so as those two things are encapsulated, um, you know, there's a cyclical nature to things that never dies. And uh, Darth Vader, of course, is the, um, you know, quintessential, like, evil, right? Although awesome, in my opinion, and many people's opinion. He's evil, right? He's bad. But, I mean... You can't have everything be all good, right? Because then there's nothing to compare it to. So, like, you need you need something opposite. Like, white can't exist without black. Light can't exist without dark. Like, you can't tell light if there's no shadow to, like, put it next to. So, um, as, as an element of necessity and the thing that keeps the world going around, like, you have to have something that's a negative force. So, of course, Darth Vader is, like, the perfect negative energy. And so as, as the continuation, um, uh, hold on, sorry, someone really wanted to help. Okay. 
So as kind of the continuation of life, like you need, uh, you need that death, you need destruction, you need uh, a renewal, or you need that kind of uh, item to destroy everything to, for renewal to take place. Okay. So I also think that there's um, a massively like, well, I mean, with the new movies, I think because Disney got a hold of it and now they're like making Disney princesses out of everybody, which is kind of awesome uh, in Star Wars. But I think before then, there was just this like massive um, lack of, of really strong f women figures. I mean, okay, yeah, Princess Leia, but she's the only one. And like, she kind of gives it up to Han at the end anyway, like V agrees, like she is really upset by this. And, um, you know, I mean, yeah, they're a great like love affair, but you know, it's just still like leaves me wanting, like she's a strong woman and like, she doesn't have to fall in love. Like she could be on her own the whole time. Like, why does she have to get the guy? You know, I don't know. Like I think, or how about a few other women that are equally as strong? Like V really feels strongly about this. So. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, just as, as a very male dominated, uh, uh, movie enterprise up until it was, uh, taken over, you know, I think it's also important to kind of bring that feminine, um, energy back into it. And so the golden Ewok is just basically kind of, um, you know, the light and the dark on the, the feminine energy that, uh, needs to be there in, um, science fiction, um, and, uh, needs to be there in culture, period, you know, and when it's lacking, um, things are really unbalanced and uh, the, the light and the dark need to be present um, for, for the continuation to keep happening. Um, so, yeah, this is kind of an Ewok's shamanic journey of transcendence, of, ah. of death and rebirth, and um, of, of an interiority of a native tribe that was totally ignored and, and you know, brushed aside as like funny background. Uh, so there you have it, Legend of the Golden Ewok. Um, yeah, so this is the original painting, it's in acrylic. Um, I usually paint only in oil but for some reason this one needed to just be acrylic because it needed to get done faster. And um, I'm sure you can see a theme here. Pretty much everything I do has something to do with like a dark femininity, um, a goddess, uh, some element of, of um, the feminine that is, is uh, ignored or um, not looked upon because as a culture we have a tendency to really idolize kind of the um, the angelic version of femininity and then uh, shove under the rug anything else that doesn't fit into that. And of course, like no one actually fits into that. And um, there, that is kind of the like mother archetype that like, you know, is best to be left in like kind of spiritual journeys and, and meditation and prayer rather than actual human beings. <laughs> There's all sorts of other things that can be put into human beings, but that kind of thing is, gets uh, complicated and real people can't ever live up to that. So, um, you know, especially when we're putting them into our movies and things like this, uh, you know, like it's best, it's best to have a multifaceted level of the goddess rather than just kind of one. But um, our culture is very, um, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, either light or, right, light or dark about it. Uh, and there's absolutely no, nothing else. Um, dualistic. dualistic, thank you. <laughs> um, awesome, so Legend of the Golden Ewok. Um, I haven't decided what painting we're gonna do next week or what booze we're gonna do next week, but, I, but uh, I, will, I will definitely put it up. So just to recap, this was, I am enjoying an absolutely amazing Japanese whiskey called Ichiro's Malt Double Distilleries from the Hanyu and Chichibu Distilleries, um, which I think kind of uh, really, really talk about why Japanese whiskey is so incredible um, in, its, um, in its entire well-roundedness as, uh, ah! as a category. Um, so I highly recommend trying some, and yeah, that's it. I hope everybody has a wonderful Sunday evening. Cheers. See you next Sunday. Bye.